Heedfulness is the path to the deathless. Heedlessness is the path to death. The heedful do not die. The heedless are as if already dead. It's one of the more famous verses in the Dhammapada. And it's the Buddha's advice on survival. On one level it sounds pretty ordinary. Any kind of survival, wilderness survival, survival in the city, requires that you be heedful. There are dangers. And if you're oblivious to the dangers, they're going to get you. But the Buddha is talking about more than just physical survival. He's talking about the survival of the good qualities of our mind, the survival of our chance for true happiness. And for him, the ultimate survival is attaining the deathless, a dimension that doesn't die. It's not affected by change, time, space. The mind can reach that dimension. This is what the practice is all about. And to reach it, though, we have to realize that the most important part of survival is the survival of the good qualities of our mind our character. Our desire for true happiness. Or in more traditional terms, our purity, our wisdom, and our compassion. Wisdom and seeing that we want a long-term happiness and not just short-term. Compassion and realizing that our long-term happiness can't depend on the misery of other people. So we have to take their well-being into consideration. And purity in really acting on our wisdom and compassion to make sure that we really don't harm anyone. Those are the principles of our survival. It's important to keep this in mind. You have all these survival courses. Of course, there's a lot of fear now about what's going to happen to the world. Ecological disaster, political disaster, all kinds of things are going to happen. And how are we going to survive? Well, it's important to remember that the important part of the survival is maintaining our basic principles of mind, maintaining our integrity. Because the body is bound to die. If it doesn't die fast, it'll die slowly. And there's nothing sadder than seeing people struggling and struggling and struggling and harming one another and then still dying anyhow, thinking that by harming one another we're going to somehow ensure our survival. And in the end, everybody dies, and a lot of people create a lot of bad karma. The Buddha said he had a vision of the world as when, before his awakening, a vision of the world as a lake that was drying up. And the water got less and less and less, and the fish start flopping around in what little water is remaining, trying to push the other fish out of the way. And of course, everybody ends up dying that way. But then, as he said, the, he saw an arrow embedded in the heart. It was the arrow in the heart that's the problem. This craving that keeps us coming back to these limited resources to birth, aging, illness, and death again and again and again. That craving to which we're a slave. And the whole purpose of the practice is to find freedom from that slavery, to realize we don't have to be pushed around by our craving. But it depends on having a very clear notion of what it means to survive, what, is, what survives, 
or the means to survival. The Buddha doesn't have his focus on the what, aside from assuring us it's not just the body. That even after death there's more coming. And so you want to make sure at the very least that that more heads in the right direction. That's why we have the precepts. They're clear. I tend to notice when people talk about the precepts, if they don't like the idea that the precepts are absolute, they say hard and fast rules. People don't like hard and fast rules, but they're actually clear cut. They're clear cut because it's easier to remember clear cut rules. Don't kill, don't steal, don't have illicit sex, don't lie, don't take intoxicants, period. And although people like to find wiggle room in them, it's again it's short sighted and heedless. Another reason why they're clear cut is that the times when you're most tempted to break them are the times when you need most need to remember them. It's a lot easier to remember clear cut promises that you make to yourself. Remember right after 9-11, everyone was saying, well, the business about not killing, and throw that away for the time being, and this business about hostility, not being cured by hostility, forget about that. I mean, this, people throwing away the basic principles that they really needed right at that time. The Buddha is not teaching us the principles just for times when they're convenient. He's teaching us for times when they're hard. When you are hungry, when someone really does threaten you, when you're really tempted to have illicit sex, tempted to lie, you can come up with all kinds of excuses for why you can get away with lying. When you're really tempted to decide, I just want to forget about everything, take some intoxicants. Those are the times when you need to remember those clear-cut principles, because that's what your survival requires, that you not give in to these desires. Because they compromise the survival of your, of your goodness, and they compromise the survival of your chances to find the deathless. And it goes back to that principle of wisdom, that long-term happiness is more valuable than short-term, or what the Buddha calls abundant happiness as opposed to limited. The abundant and happiness of the heart depends on being able to look at, back at your actions and realize you didn't harm anybody to get where you are. Even though you have to make sacrifices, and there are times when you have to say, okay, as the Buddha said, the, just as the ocean doesn't overrun its boundaries, people who are really serious about the practice will not overstep their precepts even for the sake of life. It's one of those principles that people keep forgetting, that the willingness to die for your principles is something noble, because you still have your principles. If you're willing to kill for your principles, then when you die you lose both your life and your principles. You're worse off. It's not the case that you break the precepts and you reach the deathless. You still die. But by keeping the precepts, it keeps open the possibility that you'll have the opportunity to continue practicing the path that does lead to the deathless. When you hold to the precepts, the mind finds it easier to settle down in concentration, because you've had practice in mindfulness, you've had practice in alertness. And you can look back on your actions and not be filled either with regret or denial. And you've also learned the principle of honesty. 
really looking at your actions and seeing where they really do cause harm. Because it is true that people without precepts can attain concentration, but it's a concentration that's infiltrated with dishonesty. And that kind of concentration is really dangerous. get all sorts of twisted ideas about how the, now that you've got a good solid state of concentration, the breaking of the precepts doesn't matter, that you've somehow reached a level beyond the precepts, or your ideas of what is harmful to other people and what's not harmful to other people or to yourself get twisted. So the Buddha didn't say that you can get concentration only when you have precepts, but he says concentration bears great fruit if it's fostered with virtue. Wisdom bears great fruit if it's fostered with concentration. Again, it is possible to have wisdom, possible to have discernment without strong concentration. But that sort of wisdom is very, very shallow. It doesn't really dig down deep into the mind. And it can be very easily erased and very easily grow skewed. If you don't have the, the honesty that comes with virtue and the steadiness of gaze that comes with concentration, the depth of well-being that comes with concentration that allows you not to let your hunger get in the way, because the mind is hungry. And if it doesn't have a sense of nourishment that comes from the concentration, it tends to dress up its hunger as being legitimate normal, natural. Our hunger for a comfortable life, our hunger for sensual pleasures becomes perfectly okay. Wisdom gets mixed up with cleverness. And again, it can turn back and bite you and harm the really important part of survival. So the Buddha's path here is something that doesn't depend just on comfortable times. The Buddha did say it's easier to practice when times are comfortable. When there's famine, when there's revolt, he says, it's harder to practice. But those are precisely the times when you really need all the skills you've developed during easier times. So now that we do have easier times, we should take advantage of the fact we should be heedful and work on what's really important. What kind of survival skills will we need when ecological disaster happens, economic disaster happens, political disaster happens? It really depends on the nature of the disaster. But the things that are survival skills across the board, your alertness, your mindfulness, your concentration, your discernment, your virtue, Those are things you know you will need, regardless of the particulars of the disaster. So those are the things we should work on right now. Because remember, we're not just trying to extend life, wait a little bit longer before death happens. As the Buddha said, we really do want to attain the deathless. It really is possible. There is this dimension in the mind. That can be attained, attained through the practice. And by going against the principles the Buddha found, you're closing off the way. You're being heedless. Even though it may extend the physical survival of the body. As the Buddha said, one day spent in, in the practice is worth a lot more than a hundred years without the practice. So that should be our vision of what survival means. And when that's clear, then it's obvious what the path to survival requires.
to always be heedful about what's going on in the mind, because that's where the true dangers lie. But that's also where your potentials for true treasures lie as well. <laughs>